Welcome back, everybody, to Outside the Box Stories. I am your host, Ben Rogers, and I'm so glad to have my new friend here. We just met Dan Bolton from Kingsport. Uh, he works at Eastman, who has a, a really fascinating story, and one we're going to get into here in a bit. But why don't you just start off by introducing yourself, what okay. you do. So I'm Dan Bolton. Uh, I'm a chemist by training, so which is why I work at Eastman. So I hold a PhD in organic chemistry that I got in St. Louis. And we've been in Kingsport for 14 years now. Okay. And so it's been chemistry related for my entire career. Okay. What got you into chemistry out of curiosity? Oh, the coolness. I mean, everybody knows chemistry. The first thing they say is, wow, that sounds really cool. But no, I think I think just a transformation of stuff, watching things, you know, knowing what you're going to start with and changing it to do something different. It's interesting because chemistry always felt like that was something to avoid uh, growing up. For some. Everybody <laughs> has their strengths. I like to tell people, everybody has their strengths. Chemistry is tough for some. It's tough for everyone, but some people like it, some people don't. Well, let me ask you, you know, from your chemistry background, are your fellow chemists as interested in their health as you are? Uh, is that like, is that normal for someone who's into like chemistry and you know the way things work it makes you think about what you eat i think because as, uh, with chemistry background you can understand more about chemicals and things that people put in food and things like that but i think on average i think it's uh, uh, about the same as just stand just well, i don't want to say normal people as who takes care of themselves who cares about what they eat and things like that that's super interesting because i, I would think that you know from a chemistry background you're into science you know health is science in many ways mm -hmm. Um, things are advancing so rapidly, and, uh, and that's something that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today. Is um, you were you're diagnosed with throat cancer quasi recently? Uh, 2019. Okay. So, so yes, very recently. <laughs> so kind of walk us through that. So it was uh, a squamous cell carcinoma, base of the tongue, and base of the tongue is not the tip of your tongue; it's the tongue way back here where it connects, and that was uh, the squamous cell, so skin cells. And it was caused by HPV, which is the human papilloma virus. Explain that a little bit to me, because you said a lot of words in there. I don't know which one did you not know. So the cancer, uh, so the cancer would be like a squamous cell, like you'd get like skin, skin, uh, skin cancer. Interestingly enough, we we wrote a an article. Uh, Doctor Rogers wrote an article on uh, sun and skin cancer mm -hmm. uh, this week, and squamous cell was one of the was one of the three types of skin cancer. So, so of, I did know that. So one of the things with the human papilloma virus is they have uh, like a hundred different variants. And that's the same one that gives you warts on your skin, except there are a few that uh, uh, get in places that are not so great. So this is HPV 16 and 18. And those actually cause uh, squamous cell carcinoma. It's the number one cause of cervical cancer in women. Yep. The number one cause of throat cancer in men. Did not know that. HPV. And neither did I. <laughs> uh, and so that is the number one cause, especially for those who don't smoke, because there, uh, uh, over the past 10 or 20 years, now probably 30 years, there has been a dramatic increase in the number of viral cause cancers in the human body. And HPV being one of those viral cause That's the cancers. most common. Okay. Right. okay. And so it's passed, it's passed from person to person. Some people consider it a sexually transmitted disease, but it can be passed, uh, between people sharing a drink uh, and things no like way. that. And most people can just pass it. Your body, your immune system fights it. But for the few lucky of us, around 1%, it actually turns into cancer. And the things that makes it tough is that for men, there is no good test for it. Women, you know, they go for their annual checkup. They can uh, notice abnormal cells and then take a look at them and see what they are. For men, there's not really a good check. And the th Bad, the even worse part is, is that you may never know you're infected. So normally the HPV will get where it goes and cook for 10 to 15 years. Wow. So it can cook for that long. It can cook for that long. In fact, the, re the, the reason we know that is because we traced mine back most likely to a, a endoscope. So a stomach scope that I got when I was in Germany. It was an which, which it, was how long ago? Uh, 15 years. 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So... Do we know how that could have happened through a through a surgery? Lack of cleanliness. Okay. Because the with the with the endoscopes and even fr even from the uh, from uh, uh, getting a, uh, a rectal exams or colonoscopy, yeah. since those are 
plastic, it's very difficult to clean them properly. Most things that are metal, they can go through autoclaves, high temperature steam. But if it's just chemically cleaned, if something is missed, then that virus can stay on that surface. So it's been cook. It, the HPV we think has been cooking for 15 years. Mm -hmm. How did you? How did you become aware of it? Shaving in the shower. Okay. Because that you because uh, usually what happens is Pete with, with that for men is that sometimes you can feel it on your tongue, so you might have trouble swallowing or something like that. In my case, it was a swollen lymph node. Okay. So that was even scarier because I was shaving. It's like wow, what what is that? And then uh, luckily uh, I'm in a band and my drummer. Uh, he s looked at it. I showed it to them and they said, he, s he asked the question, does it hurt? And I said, no, it doesn't. And he said, go get it checked. Thank God for that. Uh, he, he, he yeah. saved my life. And I tell him that Yeah. because most people might get that, you know, have a swollen, you know, something swollen. I mean, cause it wasn't small. It was about, if I turned my head, it was probably about the s size of a small egg. Did it? Okay. So it was larger than say, you know, inflamed lymph nodes. Right. Okay, if you have like a sore throat. Or right, it was, I would say it was probably, wouldn't, you know, about half the size, like half a boiled egg. And you didn't, before we started recording, you mentioned that you couldn't see it straight on. Right. So you had to be at a certain angle for you to see this, the sheer size of it. Correct. So okay. I, I could feel it, but I, but then I got out of the shower and I looked up and then, then whenever I stretched, I could, I could, uh, you could see it. It was, it was very visible. Okay. So, so your buddy told you to go get it checked. You got it checked. Kind of walk me through that process. Oh, that was a great one. <laughs> Needle biopsies, not uh, fun. Okay. So that's where they take. So you know, of course, they did CT scans, took a look, and said, "Yeah, you got something there," and and it really um, didn't hit home until they did the needle biopsy, where they just shove a needle right into the lymph node and take out and take out cells. So they pull it, pull a vacuum, take some cells, look at it under the microscope. So it was an instant diagnosis. I'm sorry, explain that to me. It was an instant diagnosis in what way? For them to come out, for them to stick the needle in your neck and then come back five minutes later and say, yes, you have cancer. Oh, wow. Okay, so there was no periods of anxiety, you know, a, a day or so. It was like immediate. Oh, you, for that one, it's like, you know, it's there. But, okay. now, but now comes the scary part. Man, it's in my lymph node. What am I going to do? Because, okay. you know, usually that's a really bad thing. Yeah. And so then, then it went. Then it goes to the things like PET scans, where they actually identify where the where the cancer is. Because usually, if it's in a lymph node, that is not the the primary spot. Okay. So the lymph node is just where the squamous cells drained off to. The real issue was on the base of the tongue. And did you learn that immediately, or is that over the course of that one took a long time? Okay, to to kind of trace it back, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. took a, a minute. Yeah, that took that took a couple weeks. Okay. And so did you immediately start treatment, start chemotherapy? No, because that's the, that's the, that's the tough part, right? Because nobody, nobody learns about cancer, cancer treatments until someone says, Hey, guess what? Got a surprise for you. Right. And then all of a sudden it's like, what am I going to do? What, what is going to happen? At that, at that point is, you know, a lot of the show is about, you know, being in control of your health. And mm -hmm. did you feel out of control? Oh, extremely. Like, okay. Like, what do I do? Am I, I'm, purely at the mercy of the doctors, the, you know, the science, I guess, the medications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you felt out of control at this point. I felt out of control, not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing what's going to, what's going to do, understanding what the risk factors are, understanding what your survival rate is. And that's one of the, that's one of the things I'd like to share with the audience to say that, you know, that this is not a, this is not a death sentence and I'll be open and honest about it. Right. Uh, for HPV, you're, it, it has a much higher success rate. Those those cancers seem to act a little bit differently. I'm not a, I'm not a smoker, and so it it really changed the statistics. So your um, the likelihood of survival at this point was 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 higher. So you weren't you weren't thinking the worst at that at that moment. I don't know. You tell me. I if, don't know. If you had a if someone said ah, you got a ninety percent chance everything's going to be right. Are you going to I know if, myself. I, I would focus on the ten percent. You focus on the ten percent, and right. that's what got us. And that's what got us really looking looking for looking for what's going to happen. How are we going to do this? Uh, you know, what, now us meaning you and your family, mostly me and my wife. Okay, and so not necessarily the 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 team of doctors, but you and your wife. And no, and that and that story gets a little bit better too. But I like that though because you know I think this is such a. Um, I think our health is so personal mm -hmm. and I think most everybody should be taking ownership of it 
and looking at it as something that, you know, we can take a hold of and we need to make these decisions. Right. So what was that like for, for you and your wife as you were going through the different options? Uh, how do we want to go about this? Right. At first, at first it was really, it's, it's really a tough one. It was really a tough one because yep. now you're going between, yes, now I have cancer. We don't know what kind, uh, you know, we talked about the different types of cancer. It could be what causes it. And then they say, well, there's a ray of hope. If it's HPV based, your, your, your chances are much better. So now and, the, and sudden, the alternative was, was what HPV a, based versus a standard squamous cell carcinoma that might come from smoking or, or, it. or tobacco use and things like that. And so now all of a sudden it's like, wow, Lord, please give me the good kind of cancer. Right. Right. And that's, right. and that, and those are the kind of things that you, that your mind is going through. It's like, I know I got this. How am I going to, you know, how are we going to do this? And of course the real disappointing, <laughs> I say disappointing part, but it, it's, it's really tough to, to take because whenever you do have cancer, there's the Nancy, national cancer board, the tumor board. And they say, what kind of cancer do you have? Where is it located? Here are the steps you're going to take. The, the cancer board. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that's our, that's already predetermined. Okay. So that made you feel like, you know, man, it's not really up to me now there. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a part of a protocol. Right. And that okay. is a protocol. So whenever, whenever, before, before we even the, my first visit with the oncologist, it was like, you're going to get three doses of cisplatin. You're going to get 30, 35, uh, doses of radiation. Okay. And it's like, well, what, how do you know that? Oh, it's right here in my book. And so whenever you walk in there, you, they tell you exactly what you're going to get, not because of years and years of study, because that's, that is the protocol that they are required to follow. So, you know, at this point you're, you're not thinking about alternative type treatments. No. Okay. At okay. that, at that point, at that point, we haven't done a whole lot of, uh, we hadn't done a whole lot of, of research because who, who needs it? Right. Who's who's going to who's going to go out there and say, oh, in the event I get cancer, these are the things that I'm going to do. <laughs> right. And that's and that's why I'm glad. So glad you guys are putting this on, because it gives, it helps people see th other things are out there before they have to deal with it. Yeah. And I, I really want to dig into that statement, because I think that's something that everybody can learn from, especially with, you know, we're all have, you know, fears. Sure. You know, and cancer is one of them. And the way you've gone about it is super inspiring. And, but to get to that, I want to know, like, did you actually go through the traditional protocol? Oh yeah, I did. Okay. And, 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 the, and, and that's because at that point we really didn't have anything, anything, any to, reason not to, we didn't have anything else to go on. Right. But I give kudos to my wife who's sitting over here for your yep. camera audience. She's sitting over in the corner. She's the one who really dug into it. Uh, because for me, I was very lucky that we got into the treatment. Well, I felt I was lucky, <laughs> different story, that we got into the treatment right away. So it wasn't that long after I got my PET scan that I started my first dose of cisplatin and started the radiation. And the the reason I did that, because they said, you know, it's one of those ones where you get back to statistics. It says, if you do this, you're going to, uh, um, you, you got a very good chance of survival. If you do the if you do this protocol, if you do this protocol, okay. Now the things that they kind of leave out, they mentioned it, but it, th that was by far the most excruciating thing I have ever gone through in my life. The the treatment, the treatment, yeah. Because the, we started looking at we started looking at other things that were out there, and then I got my first dose of cisplatin. And whenever you get a dose of cisplatin, forget about thinking. Because there is not a lot you can do. As I try to tell people, the cisplatin feels like the absolute worst flu you've ever had. And cisplatin, is that radiation? No, that's the, that's the chemotherapy. That's the, that, so, okay, sorry. So cisplatin, oxyplatin, all the platins are platinum-based. Okay. And so those, are, those, those work by uh, uh, cross-linking your DNA. And so they cross-link your DNA and don't allow the cell to replicate. So, okay. so their idea. So, so it's gonna it's gonna halt the cancer from spreading. Mm, it does the idea, but okay. what it really does is it attacks every cell in your body. All the other cells. Got it. Okay. So, so the, the that's the, why you feel sick. So the thing is, is that it tries to. So their idea is that if we slow down the can the growth of the fast replicating cells, which would be cancer then that's what we're going to do. Got it. Now, the other the problem you run into is that other places like stomach linings, uh, uh, hair, those are also fast-growing cells. 
which is why usually people lose their hair and things like that. Right. But it is it is absolutely excruciating and debilitating whenever you get on cisplatin. So, but what's interesting to me is, especially with cancer, because you know we're huge believers in a healthy blend of traditional mm -hmm. and alternative. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think you know, with my mindset, if if I was diagnosed with cancer, I would think about going that traditional route. Um, because of the severity of it, right? And well, and in your mind, once you get that, once you get that diagnosis, your clock is ticking, right? That's the way you think. It's what am I going to do? And you know, my wife was very supportive, and she was asking, "Do you really want to do this?" And I had to say to her one day, "You're not sitting in my seat." And so you said no. So I said no. Okay. I said I said we're going to start with this, and and because the thing is, is it's great, it's 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 great to to give advice, but. In the end, if you're sitting in that seat saying, I'm the one who has it, I've got this in my body, I want it out. Right. That is a real tough thing to deal with. So at that point, you were saying no to the traditional route. No, I was saying yes to the traditional. However, we hadn't done a whole lot with the alternative. Okay. Right. So we started in that and then we, and then, uh, Leah started hitting, Leah's my wife, hmm? uh, started, to Leah. Start, start, started hitting the books, hitting the internet. And uh, coming up with alternative methods. Now that's that's a blessing and a curse. Well, for one, you know, it's everyone knows you can't trust everything you read on the internet. You can't trust everything, right? But I, I know that your background mm -hmm. would probably be helpful in being able to sift through the real bad information. Right. And that's, and that's where it really came in handy. Now, un unfortunately, one of the side effects of cisplatin is your brain turns into oatmeal. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that we had to talk through is, you know, as she's throwing scientific papers at me, here you go, read this one, read this one, read this one. I just had to say, stop. You, we need to figure out a better plan. And so really trying to go through. So she did the, a lot of the legwork on trying to pick out the best ones. And then, and then we could evaluate those. At this point, did you bring in doctors on this side project? No, oh, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. Uh, because that's in, in that, because then it gave me, because then we could start looking at new things because then I started the radiation. And for those of you who are curious, it is right here in the throat. So 35 doses of x-ray every day, one every single day. And the, uh, the part. So for 35 days, for 35 days straight, except they gave me the weekends off. And so for the, so just to put it in perspective, cisplatin makes you think you're dying. The radiation makes you wish you were dying. Got it. Because, yeah. you know, because with that, you can't swallow. I had to get a feeding tube. Yeah. Uh, that screw, that's the one that screws up all of the salivary glands. Uh, you know, the chances of, uh, of, you know, turning, you know, everybody's worried, t telling you, you got to be careful. Uh, you're, it's going to turn your neck into wood. And so what do they give you? They give you Vaseline, of which does nothing. But we do have, and that's where we started looking. That's kind of what kind of stuck us to the natural stuff or at least looking for alternatives, because we found this great cream uh, that's made by Arbonne that, uh, I mean, she, it, it, my neck, you would never tell. Mm -hmm. it, it even surprised the oncologist on how well my neck did. And so, and it's one of those ones, it's like, well, can we tell your patients about it? And this is where we get into the whole doctor thing. And we asked them, well, we'd like to tell your patients about it. They said, mm, no. You got it. We said, hey, got it. feel my neck. And they said, that's fantastic. And they, they, we said, we'd like to tell your patients about it. And they said, no, because there's no scientific studies on it. Right. And so that's kind of, so that's kind of, uh, that's what we did afterwards because we were a little more courageous. But during that whole time at the beginning, we went out and found these alternative methods and started evaluating what they did, how they worked, because really under trying to understand which ones could be real and which ones are probably more snake oil. Yeah, which is super complicated. Which is super complicated <laughs> because there there's somebody trying to sell something everywhere. Yeah. And I always caution people to say if there is a an article and they sell the product in the article, be aware. Right. Can I ask um at what where's our timeline right now? All right, you you said you were diagnosed in 2019. Are we into the pandemic yet? Are we No, no, no. no. Okay. Okay. No, I was I was wearing a mask before it was cool. <laughs> Or it's not really cool. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Before you had to. You're getting ready. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a different story as well. So, that's, and that's the hard part, too, because some of my beliefs with COVID are probably don't align with mainstream. Sure. And that's, and that's part of the stuff that we learn 
by uh, through all this medical stuff that we went through. So let's let's dig into some of these alternatives mm-hmm. and and what you learned. Um, and also we'll mix in some coaching for, for people out there who want to do some of their own mm-hmm. research. Um, because I think that's important. You know, I think you need a team like Leo on your side where, Absolutely. where you guys are doing your other stuff. And yeah, you know, I, I would like to think that, you know, you'd be able to bring it to your doctors and it, it be a collaboration. You would hope you would hope. Uh, oh, and I'm going to throw out there that prayer is probably Rock, the number one thing. Rock on. God's yeah. the ultimate healer. Yep. And, uh, uh, but, um, but whenever we started looking at that, we 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 picked a couple that were that were that were something that we could do. Meaning treatments. Meaning treatments. Meaning alternative treatments. Were, to, you, were you worried about like, okay, well, what if what if the consequences of these treatments are like negative? Well, that is the beauty of it, right? You know, we we if we talk about LD fifties, an LD fifty is the lethal dose for fifty percent of the population. So whenever they measure toxicity of things, they talk about LD50s. And what they'll do is they'll take like, let's say the, the test medium is mice. They'll take 100 mice. They'll give all of them the same amount. And whatever amount it takes to kill 50% of them, that's your LD50. Okay, so explain that to me in layman's terms. Like, what does that mean? All right, <laughs> if you had 100 people and I, we're, we're going to keep feeding you cheeseburgers, the number of cheeseburgers it takes for 50 of you to die then we'll know how many te- how many cheeseburgers we can assign a toxicity to those cheeseburgers. Got it. Okay. So, so and when I say that, it, it's it's really it's really telling you how toxic something is. Okay. So can I take a little bit and and it kills me, or can I take a lot of it and it kills me? Okay. So when you're looking at these treatments, you're looking at LD fifty. Mm-hmm. You're looking and at toxicity. The- okay. Right. And so because you always have to weigh that. But the thing is, is whenever I line up, whenever I was taking my cisplatin, it was now this is going to blow your mind. In the in the micrograms per kilogram of weight, so I could take for every kilo that I that I weigh or every pound, it's a very small amount that I could take that before it would kill me. So because it, of the toxicity, because of the toxicity, it's extremely toxic. But the but the first two that we looked at was vitamin C. Okay, it's a great place to start. Right, vitamin okay. C. <laughs> we take it every day. We know that we can take. 2,500 milligrams in a tablet, right? But we, but if you look at it, the toxicity is off the, is, is so low, right? It's just a simple acid, ascorbic acid. But what we found out through the literature is that you could actually take high dose vitamin C. Got it. And it, that's 50 grams. And you, I'm assuming you took it intravenously. That has to be intravenously. Right. And that because your body can only absorb so much. So we knew that we, and, and, the, and the nice thing about that one is that it is extremely active. I mean, first off, it's great against antiviral things. We've, we've seen that. But it also does very well for, uh, um, for cancer because a- cancer can't live in an oxygen environment. So this, the, the citric acid or the uh, vitamin C can uh, surround cells and actually form ox- high oxygen concentration. So it's great for your cells, but it's bad for cancer. Got it. So Got it. they, they do, the cancer cells do not like oxygen. And so, so you want to suffocate it. That so way. you, so you can suffocate it kind of, uh, right. in that way. And so, but the thing is, is it has to be through, uh, uh, IV. So one thing I know about high dose vitamin C is you do need to get a G6 PD. Uh, you need oh, get, yes, yes, yes. You need, do you understand that? At, Cause I don't, but you need to get that, you need to get a G6 PD before, um, just to make sure that that lab level is mm-hmm. you don't have it or something. Right. It's all about the metabolism and stuff like that. Okay. To see if to see if you can actually take that amount. Right. See if you can get see if you can take that much and and the thing because that's a water soluble vitamin uh, and so it's it's passed through the system quite quickly. But if you okay. but if you have some of those uh, 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 genetic uh, uh, right abnormalities and or it, just and it's a one time test yeah. w- w- things that you got to be careful around that one. But that's one of the things that we that we did and the other one was fenbendazole. And I don't know what that is. Fenbendazole is the main ingredient in Panacure C, which is a, a, a dog dewormer. Okay. I, I never heard of that. Yep. And, uh, and so we took, and so I started taking that one. And, uh, and, and so, and the reason is because it also is extremely non-toxic. It's been in the marketplace forever since I think the forties when it was, whenever all these, ben, the Bendazoles, the Bendazole family, cause there's five or six of them that are available on the market. So why would you why would you think that that would work for this? Out of curiosity. Well, that is a cool story uh, because uh, again, I get I get the high dose vitamin C, mm-hmm. you know, because there's been 
Um, who's the godfather of vitamin C? Uh, it- Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling. Um, lots of stuff out there on him and vitamin C. And what did Linus Pauling? Is, eh. I think it was Linus. Pauling. I think it's Linus Pauling. I think it was. Um, and you know, so immediately alternative, I think high dose vitamin C, yeah. but I don't think the dewormer for animals. Well, and the thing is also, is you gotta be, that, can we take is, Leah for that? Oh yeah. Yeah. Most <laughs> definitely. And, uh, well, and, and, and just to put it in there, you know, it's it, the, with the, with the high dose vitamin C, it's, it's, that's one of those ones that if you go on the internet, they'll say, well, we gave people 50 grams of vitamin C, but they'll give it to them through orally. Right. And then you got, and that's where you kind of have to be careful on how they write the reports because if well, it's orally, 99% of that is just going to pass through your urine. Well, with any, with any sort of vitamin absorption is the whole thing. Yep. You know, making sure, you know, whether that means taking a certain type of vitamin with food mm-hmm. versus on an empty stomach. You and know. how much your, how much your intestines can physically absorb. Right. So, but that's why we do it IV. Now the fit now, now to the fenbendazole. That's kind of the cool one because, uh, uh, there was a fenbendazole. Fenbendazole. Okay. So with an A, a fenbendazole or fenbendazole? Fenbendazole. Fenbendazole. Okay. And uh, the 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 story is is that uh, Leah was looking online, and there was a story by a guy named Joe Tippins, and okay. everybody can look that up. And uh, he had uh, stage four cancer, and it was it was a, a small cell uh, lung cancer, which is different from the squamous. Uh, and uh, um, he had stage four. It was all over his body. Went down to MD Anderson. They said, "Sorry." Nothing we can do, and so he and so he was going to just go finish off his life and uh, live live a few more months, and then he caught a friend of his that said, "Hey, you have cancer. I want you to try this." So he went through. So he actually got involved in the initial state uh, testing of Keytruda, and so he went back down to MD Anderson, started the Keytruda, but taking the fenbendazole on the side. Okay. Came back for his for his PET scan. All of his cancer was gone. How long time period? I don't know. How long was that? Three months? Four months? Yeah, something like that. Whatever wow. the st- whatever the whatever because it was. It and we was, think it was the fenbendazole. Well, this is the key: is that whenever he came back, uh, whenever he came in and they saw the PET scans and it was clear, the oncologist says, "What did you do, Joe?" And he says, "I've got to be honest with you. I've been taking this dog dewormer." <laughs> and they all said, "I knew you did something different because you were the only person out of fifteen hundred people that survived." Okay, so. You know, immediately I'm thinking, okay, that's one person, mm-hmm. you know, what does that, what does that really tell us? Well, you ask the question that goes even further because how this guy that told Joe about it, how it happened, the, the, the story goes, and, I've, and it, it, it was at Merck who makes it, that they were doing these cancer trials on mice. Yeah. So they had injected them all with the tumors or the tumor cells, growing the tumors, they ended up getting worms. So they gave them the uh, uh, fenbendazole. Okay. And guess what? Cancer went away. And they couldn't, they couldn't give him the cancer back. The researcher that was doing the work ended up with a glioblastoma, which is a cancer in the brain. These are other things that you learn when you get cancer, all the different types. Okay. And, okay. and so he got, and so they started taking it and their glioblastoma went away. And so now Super fascinating. if you go to, if you go to my cancer story rocks, uh, on Facebook, uh, it tells all a bunch of different stories. Now it's not going to say it's a magic bullet. But there are a lot of people that are having success with it. Well, you know, what I'm hearing a lot just listening to you is 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 hope. It's in, hope. In reading these stories. And, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, if, if people get anything from this is is that there is hope and 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 because it plays such an important role. Yeah, but you haven't even asked me how it works. I because I don't I have no idea how it works. Because you may be sitting there saying, Well, that's all that's all hoo ha. I was just gonna believe you. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> But the but the cool part is is that this is actually the mechanism on how it works. Okay, how does because it work? you think about you. Think, how does fenbendazole work? The fenbendazole works. Uh, first off, it's design. It's designed use is for parasites. Okay. All right. And how does your how do parasites live in your body? We have this awesome immune system that God gave us. How on earth does it does a parasite live in us? They feed off of what's inside of us. But why does your immune system not see them? I don't know. Oh, neither do I. But that's the crazy part. Because what fenbendazole does is it kicks up your immune system to actually recognize them. And then whenever it does recognize them, oh. the fenbendazole actually binds with tubulin proteins. And those are those proteins that uh, grab the DNA whenever your cell replicates. Okay. So what, what I'm hearing is your immune system is, the, its eyes are opened mm-hmm. to these parasites. Mm-hmm. And parasites could be 
cancer cells. Well, well, for the design purpose, for the on label purpose, it's for roundworms, uh, all it. those, all those kind of parasites that live in your intestines. Okay, and and what we're saying off label would be. It could also see the cancer cells as well. Correct. So that's. So, so what does it do? Like, so so what so if you look at the if you look at the way these cancer cells grows it grow, all grows through mitosis they all replicate very quickly, and so with mitosis is that the DNA replicates and then these proteins these tubulin proteins come from the the end of the cell and they grab the rep the, the two copies and they pull them apart into two new cells. Okay. What the fenbendazole does is it binds with the tubulin to not allow these cells to separate. And so it goes through a process called apoptosis that causes a cancer cell to die. Okay, and this is fenbendazole. This is fenbendazole. Now, interestingly enough, there's another chemotherapy called Taxol that does the same thing, but to every cell. And that's the big difference is your, the, your healthy cells are staying together mm -hmm. versus, you know, when you do get chemo, you know, it's taken, it's taken everything. Right. You know, which is why you, you get real sick. Right. Okay. And, and, there, and, and we have a personal story where, uh, cause within that, within that website, I mean, there's a lot of hope, right. And so we bring it. And so we, we have these communications and just to, just to tell you, we, we caught up with someone who lives in another country. I'm not going to tell you where, cause I don't want to get anybody in trouble. And they said, we're having a hard time getting fenbendazole here. Can you see if you can, if you can get us some? And so we set up some, we set up some, uh, uh, got made other connections and was able to get him some. He had stage four liver cancer, stage four. The, the oncologist said the exact same thing. And this was in October. And of 20? No, of 20, yeah. Okay. And so this was in October and he started taking it. And then on Thanksgiving day, our Thanksgiving day, he called us in tears because his cancer was gone. Man. That's amazing. And so for, for people that come back and say, well, Dan, you know, you're just reading stories on the internet. That was the one that we were a part of. Super cool. That's yep. really cool. Now, we've talked about high-dose vitamin C, mm -hmm. then bendazole, and then you tried other treatments. Yep. We still do artemisinin. And artemisinin, that's, that's, uh, that's biblical. So as, as, the, as, the, uh, 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 as the star fell from the sky called Wormwood and soured the waters... This is a revelation term. So look it up. There is a there is a, a chemical called artemisinin that comes from the sweet wormwood plant. Okay. And uh, it there is nothing sweet about it. But it's an actual it's, drug. It's an actual drug. Artemisinin. Artemisinin. Okay. It's a hard one to say and a hard one to spell. And uh, but that one that one is uh, extremely potent as well. In fact, there's a great uh, 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 scientist that that gave a wonderful presentation on the mechanism of artemisinin. And it comes, but it does, it comes from a natural plant. It's, it comes from the sweet wormwood. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it works with iron. And, and, the, and the thing is, is that cancer cells are extremely high in iron. So there's two things that cancer loves. It loves sugar, loves iron. And so. Interesting. Well, which is one of those bad things. That's I knew sugar. That's the way PET scans work, right? But then that's kind of the other thing. If you go to the uh, oncologist's office, what are they giving you? Here, eat some sugar, keep your weight up, drink milkshakes. And so that's one of those things. It's like, ah, man, you know, my cancer is eating off sugar. Why don't I kind of cut down on sugar? Interesting. So, but the artemisinin is interesting because uh, from, a, you know, I'll show my geek, it's got a peroxide in the, in the uh, structure, which means that if it comes in contact with iron, it splits that open and makes free radicals and kills. And, and free radicals are extremely bad, as you know. Okay. Can you, can you say that just one other way so I can understand? No. You've been showing your geek the whole side, Man, the I whole time, you. though. But it's but but it's one of those <laughs> ones. It's like it's like hydrogen peroxide. Okay. All right. Artemisinin. Is. Artemisinin. Just think of it as like an organic hydrogen peroxide, because uh, you know whenever you put whenever you put uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide on a cut, okay, what does it do? Uh, it hurts. It, well, and it bubbles. I didn't know that. Yeah, if you put it on blood, it bubbles, and that's because the peroxide is breaking down into oxygen. Okay. And it does that because of the metals in your blood. Okay. Right. And all the other things in there because it's unstable. But the nice thing about artemisinin is it likes to be in an iron rich environment. And if it gets in there, it makes those chemicals and it causes that cell to die. So you, in that case, the iron's good. In that case, the iron's good. Okay. Because it mixes, it gets in the cancer cell and yes, it get, it can go anywhere. But since the concentration of iron is so high in the cell. Because of the cancer? Because of the cancer. Okay. Okay, got it. And so it causes those it causes the artemisinin to break down into these caustic compounds, which causes a cell to die. Interesting. Yep. 
Okay. So I recommend you look it up. I wish I wish I would have thought ahead to get you the address, the 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 YouTube address. If you're interested, I could share with your audience if, if they're if they'd like to see it. But it's because we'll, it's extremely informative. What we'll do is we'll we'll put all these links in the show notes so everybody who wants to dive a little bit deeper will have all these links mm-hmm. uh, linked up once we publish this. But okay, art of medicine, and you are you trying these all in unison? Well, we started we started the high dose vitamin C and the and the finven is all first. And and the interesting story for us now, because people come back and say, "Well, why didn't you? Why didn't you just? Uh, why did you do the? Why didn't you just do the traditional stuff? Or the, I'm sorry, the uh, the uh, off label things? It's like, well, we didn't know about it. We got started. We got started. You're with in the, a period of testing, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. right. And so I started. So we started this about halfway through, and people say, "Well, how do you know it worked? Uh, well, the thing is, is that is that you know I was trying to work, um, you know, my kids through it because that's the other part is that the family is going through this with you. Yep. And so, you know, I tried to work with my son. He was very scared. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, let's take a picture of it every day and of my work, tumor. When you say work with your son, you mean um, explain things to him? Uh, explain, yeah, well, the, the explain, explanation is pretty good. Our media does a great job in scaring people all the time. Yes. Right. And so, and so you know, the, they're all of a sudden, you know, they hear cancer. They don't know. For kids, they don't hear it's this type. It's this type. Here's your chances. Here's your chances. All they hear is cancer. Totally. They, and and what do they and what do they relate cancer to? Death. To death. Right. And so with my son, he's the youngest. Um, uh, I worked with him to say let's 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 see if let's show the treatments working. Okay. And so I had this lymph node on my neck. I see. I've forgotten. It's on this side. And uh, so I said, every day I'm going to stand in the same spot. I'm going to look at the same light, and you're going to take a picture. It's cool. Okay. And so, but one of the things that kind of bothered me is that the oncologist, when I first started, said, don't be discouraged if you go through this whole treatment and nothing changes. Sometimes it takes a while. And during those first, first, probably the first month, because I think we started the treatment after the first month. Uh, the first month, I didn't see any change. Started the alternative treatments. Yeah, okay. started the alternative. Yeah. On the first month of treatments, a lot of pain, didn't see a lot of change. Whenever we started taking the, the vitamin C, the fenbendazole, and the art of medicine, my tumor dissolved. Like immediately? Like within a couple of weeks. Wow. And so we have all that footage that shows up to, up to, our, the, the new treatment just went away. And that was another thing that surprised the uh, oncologist. Well, yeah. Wow. We did a great job. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, like... Yes, <laughs> I'm surprised it worked that well. But that's but that's the whole thing is that that's what we that's that is what we saw. So now, what, could I could I have stopped it the the the, the treatment? I definitely could. But I explain that. What, what what do you mean? So whenever I saw those, because and that's the and, you could think I'm good, and that's or, and that's where I'm kind of kicking myself for not just saying, "Wow, that's doing great." So just cut off all that other stuff that hurts so bad. Oh, so you're doing you're doing the traditional protocol in addition and okay. to that one, and trying Got to it. shove that stuff down a feeding tube. That was a challenge in itself. No kidding. And I and you know and I tell people this. I said because it, it, because it, it, whenever I tell people about this, they look at me like, "Oh, you're insane." I said, but the thing is, what does it hurt? You are taking things that have zero toxicity. And you're questioning that, yet you're standing in line for something. If they give you one milliliter more, you are going to die. Right. So, so whenever, you're, you're, at this point, you're like, well, yeah. what do I have to lose? Yeah, it's, exactly. And then people come, but we've shared it with people. And say, well, you know, I don't know. I don't, should I put it in my yogurt? I don't want to really take it today. It's like, no, you take it every day and you get it down there because there is so much evidence that we've seen that it works. That you should, we think you should try it, but again, and it's up the, to the person. Artemisinin. Artemisinin. I, I think the, the high dose vitamin. If if I if I leave this and people hear what I say, high dose high dose vitamin C, fenbendazole, and the artemisinin. To me, those are the top three. You mentioned artemisinin was super potent. Does mm-hmm. that mean toxic? No. Okay. What it's, do you mean by potent? Uh, well, the the most effective from what we from what Got, we okay. saw. I mean, because okay. there's other things, you know, like milk thistle and things like that that I think do help. But I, but I think those are the ones that direct it more because because a lot of those things are building up your immune system. Based on your background, are the is that trio 
does it only work for certain types of cancer cells or at certain stages? Uh, I mean, I know this and, is, and, and don't have to like make claims. No, 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 but, no. But, but this is where it gets interesting, right? Because okay. there is a lot of evidence out there. In fact, some of the, there are, there, there is, there are more studies taking place with these, with these off label drugs. The problem they run into is that it's it's not like a study to where like okay these these folks have cancer we're going to give them this and see what happens. It's more like they mix it with other things. It's like we gave them uh, fenbendazole and then shot them with radiation and we didn't see a decrease in tumor size. It's like that's not what fenbendazole does. And so, but now they're getting more into. Um, seeing how these how these uh, medicines work by themselves because in the end look it, it let's be honest the pharmaceutical company's here to make money for sure. for my treatments for cisplatin it was ten thousand dollars a shot i believe it so off of me that was 30 grand for the fenbendazole during the whole treatment i think we spent probably 20 bucks <laughs> so where are they doing their research it's a little frightening. It's a little frightening. Now right. they do have, they do have a people version. People say, "Well, why don't you take the people version?" There is one called mebendazole, which is almost the exact same, and that's where the chemistry comes in what handy. What is people version? Was it mebendazole? What is people version? Meaning that's this is the drug that they because the fenbendazole is only for animals. The mebendazole is for people. Did you and you took the animal one? Mm -hmm. And you know why? No. Because the mubendazole is $400 a pill. Uh, were you not a little concerned, like once for an animal? Like no, because that's, again, where the chemistry comes in. <laughs> whenever, they make, whenever they make medicines, so most of, the, most of the animal medicines people don't know are actually people medicine. So if you, okay. so if you go in and you get, like, uh, uh, um, like we just took our dog in and, uh, for, for some hip issues, and they gave her... Uh, no, no. What's 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 the one you take? Sorry, online camera. I'm asking my wife a question here. Uh, what which the uh, muscle the ibuprofen? Oh, all right. Say say you give them amoxicillin, right? Say okay. they get a, say they get an infection. It's meloxicam. That was the one meloxicam. So we have a people version as well. So you get meloxicam for a dog. It's the exact same meloxicam you get for, as a person. You get amoxicillin for a dog. It's the same. That's the same one that you get. And it's, people, a, it's just a different label. It's a different label. And people come back and say, well, that's a lower quality. No. Because so, when the pharmaceutical company is making something, they have to follow the same procedures for everything. Same pro Like same process. Same process, same purification. They're not going to say, well, that didn't work out right. Go to the dogs. So <laughs> all these things are the same. All these things are the same. Especially going from mubendazole people, fenbendazole dogs. Interesting. They're, they are chemically different a little bit, but I can show people this and explain it, that really the business side does not change. And the reason they do that is for patent protection. That's super fascinating. Right. And, and really with your background, it makes perfect sense why you would be able to kind of decipher between the two. So, but I took the, I took the dog one. It's so yeah. funny when you, when you said people version, I was thinking, okay, is that like a, for the people type, yeah, for, you, know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, is that like a little more the constitutional? <laughs> like maybe a little more uh um friendly you know mm -hmm. whatever <laughs> yep okay so you did these three things any was there any other medications that you that you tested anything that uh was interesting uh well i mean of course we took vitamins you know just standard vitamins try to get uh, try to get uh, uh other those other things like milk thistle and okay. other stuff like that uh it took a lot but a lot of those things we we took together and asked me the question did i ever tell my oncologist i was taking that stuff I'm guessing you did. I did not. Uh. And why? Because they because they would believe they, they there are some some will be fine with it. Others will say absolutely not because that's outside of our protocol. Would fact, they take you off as a patient? They, they could take you off as a patient. And that's again where I encourage people to stand up and say it is your body. Okay, so let's dig into that because I think that's important. How do you do that like because I think a lot of us do feel like we're we're a part of the system at mm -hmm. some point, and there's only so much we can do. You know, how do we actually take ownership of of our body and the, and with the decisions made? Like, is there any coaching you could give us on that? Oh man, see, this is going to make people mad because it's my personal viewpoint. That's okay, right? Because I do think I do think as a, as a society we have put f physicians on an extremely high pedestal. Agreed. 
And and the problem is, is we have to remember that they don't know any. No, they don't know everything. Agreed. And they're and and by law, there are only certain things that they can and can't do. So, for example, if a physician learned about fenbendazole and they said, "I want you to try it," that would be illegal because they cannot prescribe fenbendazole for an for an off label application. So the kicker is they actually can't mm-hmm. suggest this. There you are, have to do this on your own. Right. I mean, there are there are physicians that like, oh, there's some other things that we took, like berberine. There's another drug called metformin. Oh, yeah. Which is which is great for sugar control. Yeah. But it's for sugar control, not for cancer. Because remember, cancer lives on what? Sugar, sugar. and iron. Sugar and iron. And if, But if a physician came up and said, I want you to try this metformin for your cancer. They can't. That is now it. illegal. Got it. And so, but then, but then on the other hand, there are other, there are other physicians that say this is what we're supposed to do. This is what the book says. We're going to do it. I actually had an oncologist say to me, "Do not eat blueberries." Okay. Because blueberries are extremely antioxidant. They have a lot of antioxidant properties. So wouldn't you want those? Well, not if you're taking cisplatin. Because cisplatin is working through, ah, geek talk, oxidation properties that that antioxidant could potentially stop. Now. You cannot hide your geek, man. Man, I know it. It's hard. <laughs> but, it, but that's the kicker because, but that's where, but that's where it's kind of strange because you think, man, I think you're taking some blueberries. It's like, no, don't eat blueberries. Don't eat anything with color. Don't eat vegetables. Don't eat anything. Because we don't want any antioxidants to interact with that medication. But remember the toxicity of that cisplatin. That will overwhelm any antioxidant that you take meaning it wouldn't matter if you it ate it it wouldn't matter if you ate one blueberry or five thousand right but they came back and told me don't eat blueberries so coach us on how to go about our our health in general here let's write like because i'm interested I'm, there's like a theme that i'm feeling out that doesn't only have to do with cancer mm-hmm. And, you know, from a preventative standpoint, you know, there's certain things that we're all trying to avoid, you know, mm-hmm. cancer being one. And, you know, what would you suggest that with your experience? For me, I always tell people it's moderation. Of everything? Of everything. Okay. And, 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 if, and if God didn't make it, you shouldn't eat it. Okay. With right? You? Yeah. And so, and you know, I can get on. I love to, I love to talk about high fructose corn syrup. Because, you know, I always tell people, it's not bad for you. <laughs> right? No, no, no. But let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because whenever you make it, it's, 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 it's the amount we eat. And the reason high fructose corn syrup is so bad for you is that if you want to make, if you want to drink a Coke and it's got sugar, way too much sugar, sugar's bad. But if you wanted to drink a Coke made out of sugar, what do you have to do? You have to boil the water, you have to stir the sugar, you have to make it all dissolve. Whenever they develop high fructose corn syrup, not only is it coming out as a liquid and it dissolves immediately, but you can actually put more in it. So it's the pure amount of it. It's the, it is, that, it, that where, where you find it, the volume of it is so high. It's the volume. And so that's where I always say, first off, God did not make high fructose corn syrup. So don't, don't eat it. Right. Because you don't, and, the, and, the, and what I tell people is like, you don't know how much is in there. If you put a tablespoon of sugar in your coffee, you know how much is in there. But man, if you get a pre-made Starbucks, oh, I shouldn't say the name, uh, char, uh, something other company, you know what I'm saying, uh, of mucho macho frappi latte, lucky mariato, you don't know how much is in there. So more, So me, it's about moderation. Don't drink Diet Cokes because now you have an artificial sweetener. Your body does not know how to deal with it. Yep. Your body knows how to deal with sucre, with glucose and fructose. Those are the two sugar. Well, and of course, the manoses and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the uh, uh, but it doesn't do well. That's you know like 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 lactose intolerant. Most people are lactose intolerant because we're not supposed to be drinking milk. You, you would, with the enzymes that you have to break down the simple disac or disaccharide. Of uh, of lactose, we we stop making the 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 enzymes for it. Totally with you, right? Yeah. And so so for me, it's about moderation and choosing those things that are that are smart. Okay, how about how do we how should we go about our healthcare um, as we navigate the system? Um, how can we take more ownership of it? How can we have the Leas in our lives 
you know, make sure we, we make good decisions in terms of who we go see, uh, what we accept and don't accept, Mm -hmm. you know, what's your thoughts? To me, it's more about, it's, it's more about, uh, uh, doing your research. Okay. I think, I think people really need to take, take their part in their, uh, in their health. Because if you blindly go up and just start doing what people tell you to do, you really need to you really need to take a step back and say, first off, why is it happening? I mean, we're, we really have a medical, and I don't want to make anybody mad on this one too, but we really have a medical system that treats symptoms. Agreed. Not the actual cause, right? We don't have, we, instead of going out there and thinking to yourself, why is this happening to me? I've got high blood pressure. I've got high cholesterol. Should I take a statin? Mm. First off, ask the question, why do you have high blood, high cholesterol? What do you do? What steps are you taking to change it? And again, for each person, it's going to be an experiment. And I, and I recommend people go back and say, well, you know, what? I eat a lot of cheeseburgers. I think I'm going to take cheeseburgers out of my diet and see how that affects my cholesterol. Instead of walking up and saying, I need something to reduce my cholesterol. We right. should be more in charge of the things that we put in our bodies, the things that we do. Are we getting enough exercise? Are we supporting our immune system? I mean, even with what we've learned about COVID, the things about vitamin D that we're learning is fantastic. Unbelievable. And, and I think vitamin D, that's a new chemical, right? <laughs> no. And but but and but we don't even know if we have enough vitamin D in our bodies. We don't know if it's active. And these are the things that we need to be more I I believe that we need to be more involved in. And if and if some and if a physician says something that doesn't make sense, ask a question. Exactly. Exactly. Like I like we believe that it needs to be more of a partnership versus Absolutely. You know, so often in the traditional setting, you you see a you know physician or provider basically just talking to people mm-hmm. instead of it being a conversation. And I think when you have a conversation, you can start to get to those root causes. You know, because a lot of times if it's just talking, you're not getting feedback from from the patient. Yeah. You know, it's just super fascinating. Yeah. And and but and, but unfortunately, we we have gotten to a society that we don't have that that two way street. Okay. Right now, it's to me it feels and and what we learn is it is a one way street. And if you do question, it, and, and, you, and that's the whole thing. I would say question, but the thing you have to be ready for is that some physicians are okay with it, others are not. Because with that one-way street, there has been a lot of egos that have been built up. Sure. Well, one thing that's interesting that you touched on a little bit is the stuff that you've tried and tested, there's no double-blind studies yep. for. And... Uh, with your background, you're very familiar with with that whole world. Uh, can you explain it in a way that's kind of you know layman's terms? Because Dr. Rogers talks a lot about you know okay, just because there's not a double blind study for you know the use of this on that mm-hmm. doesn't mean it doesn't work. I mean, in his in his voice, I've been seeing patients for 35 years. I see it, it works, right? You know, and with COVID in particular, you know there there's not enough time right. to wait for a double blind study. Right. You know? Well, and that's, and it, and it all depends on how they set up the experiment. I have been extremely disappointed with our scientific community during this COVID time. How so? I don't know if I'm allowed to say this on camera, but I, I do think a lot of our, in, in the, in the old days, back when I was in school, we would have a hypothesis. We would build up a, a, a test method to test the hypothesis and then make the decision whether it was correct or incorrect. Now it seems as though as we already know the answer, and we build our experiments to prove that the answer is right and ignore the data that doesn't show that. Got it. Right? Yeah. Because we look at things like, uh, you know, it, 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 it even use like the Pfizer study for the, uh, for the efficacy of the, of the vaccine. They give 20,000 people a placebo, 20,000 people uh, the vaccine and say, go home. Now, we got, they got great results. But what we don't know is what those people did. We don't know. Did post? Post, or- post, post medication. Okay. Right. Post vaccine. Now, I'm not saying I'm not saying one way or the other vax or anti vax or whatever. But the thing is, is I don't know if they gave the vaccine to somebody that goes home and works at, in their office at home and never contacts anybody. Or they gave the placebo to a meat pla- meat packing worker who's working shoulder to shoulder next to somebody. And so we really don't have a control as to what the you know, how effective it was by what their behaviors were. I mean, even with some of these mass studies that we see. We see a lot of studies that we, we see. A, you see a lot of studies that say they're not that effective based on where we where we've put people. But then you go to other people, uh, other studies on the extreme that say, oh, they they block everything, even air. 
but and that's the and that's the struggle we have because if you have a scientist that wants to prove their theory, they will choose the studies to to make that real. I don't know. Does that make sense? It makes it makes total sense. I, I don't know exactly how to like how we would avoid that because I, I feel like it's kind of natural to from a cognitive bias standpoint to want to you know I feel like you know our country as a whole has been you know a little bit you know no. in that cognitive bias you know mindset and I'm not saying <laughs> and I'm not saying the scientists are totally to blame because it's the people as well right. because from a confirmational bias standpoint we as humans will tend to go find those reports that that tell us what we think we already know right and unfortunately with the internet I mean if you work hard enough, you can find something to support, you know, <laughs> whatever well, you're wanting to. And to flip it back to the health side, you know, that's what we saw as well. And that's where you have to be careful. Yeah. Because for anything you want, you, that you, if you go out there and you find something that, that says works for cancer, I promise you, you will find another study that says the exact opposite. So with your experience, like, how do we work through that? You know, how do we, how do we trust what we're looking at? And, you know, and how do we, you know, how, how are you so... Um, obviously you saw the results, mm, mm. but I'm assuming that you had some sort of, um, uh, I don't want to say faith, but like, uh, belief that, mm. um, that it was going to be helpful. Well, I will be honest with you. When we first started it, it was kind of like, mm, I don't know. We'll see. But you know, that's, and that's part of it. Is it, is it, I think there is, there is a little bit of, uh, you know, you got to do your due diligence. You got to do your, the risks versus reward. Yeah. And, Really give it a shot and pay attention. So tell us where we're at now. Tell us where we're at now. So in, in for me... Of, in, in terms of diagnosis, so, everything with cancer. So diagnosis was fine. You know, so now I'm cancer-free. So we're going on two years. Praise Jesus. Unbelievable. And uh, um, and so, you know, and, and, and it, this has been the longest uh, longest struggle that I've been through. You know, one of the things, one of the side effects of the radiation, as you saw, I just got a drink of water is that I don't make as much saliva as I used to. Mm -hmm. It's getting better every day. I keep praying for it. But uh, uh, but it's, it has taken me, I probably got my taste back um, uh, probably earlier this year where I could actually start tasting things. And yeah. so when people come up and say, oh, I got COVID, I lost my taste for a month or for a week. I said, mm -hmm, cry it for a year and a half. Hmm. <laughs> it could always be worse. But things like neuropathy, I'm now coming off of that. And so, you know, but, but again, you know, I, you know, it, it, I feel, and you know, I feel horrible and I would, that's part of our mission now to help people get through this. Yeah. But like we're talking now, what can we do to prevent it? Final message, uh, for the people out there listening who have stuck with us. Uh, for those who have stuck with us, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I hope we didn't put you to sleep too much. <laughs> uh, but you know, but my, my biggest thing is if you do happen to have the unfortunate things of, of these bad medical conditions, I mean, just remember there's always hope. Your, your medical, uh, direction should be directed by you. And if things don't seem right, or if you want to take different pathways, that is 100% in your power. Now, the thing is, is you have to be courageous. You have, you can't go timid. You have to stand up. You have to do your research. You have to have your, uh, uh, uh the, your abilities to stand up and actually articulate your ideas because some of these things you might need in a prescription. Things like doxycycline has been proven to be extremely well, or extremely good for cancer. Got to get a prescription. So you got to find somebody who can work with you to do that. But they're not going to find it for you. And so that's the whole thing is get up there, do your research, see what makes you feel better, stick with it, and, and just, and you know, and believe. Thank you so much for that. Super inspiring. Uh, this has been so outside of the box. This show is all about, you know, things that you can do within your control to take, con to, prevent things from happening from being your to be your healthiest self and uh dan bolton man it's been amazing hey my pleasure i really appreciate the time um and i hope to have you back on the show we'll get you with dr rogers we'll wrap about this a little bit more yeah no problem i'll bring my lab coat next <laughs> guys this has been outside the box this has been such an outside the box story with dan bolton we appreciate dan we're super thankful that you're cancer free uh i've been your host and rogers thank you for joining us we'll see you next time don't go away Hey, was that all right? God, that was amazing. Like, I, I, I feel like I, I stretched it way too long, and I apologize. Yeah. I, just, I just wanted to keep going, and, you know, it, it was just fun talking to you. Oh, good. Well, I appreciate yeah. that. And that was, like, that was inspiring.